Amen. Thanks for being here uh, this morning. Uh, let me let me share a story with you that uh, I read, and it just was it was powerful and speaks into uh, I think where we where we want to go this morning. It says Melanie Jasper says her son Cooper was born with a smile on his face. The dimple never left his cheek. He won the hearts of every person he knew, his three older sisters, parents, grandparents, teachers, and friends. He loved to laugh and love. His father, J.J., calls him practically a perfect child. And Cooper was born into a near-perfect family. Farm-dwelling, fun-loving, God-seeking, and Christ-hungry, J.J. and Melanie poured their hearts into their four children. J.J. cherished every moment he had with with his only son. That's why they were riding in the dune buggy on July 17, 2009. They intended to cut the grass together, but the lawnmower needed a spark plug. And while Melanie drove to town to buy one, J.J. and five-year-old Cooper seized the opportunity for a quick ride. They had done this a thousand times, zipping down a dirt dirt road in a roll cage cart. The ride was nothing new, but the flip was. On a completely level road, with Cooper safely buckled in, J.J. made a circle, and the buggy rolled over. Cooper was unresponsive. J.J. called 911, and then he called Melanie. There's been an accident, he told her, and I don't think Cooper is going to make it. The next hours were every parent's worst nightmare, an ambulance, an ER, sobs, and shock. And finally, the news. Cooper had passed from this life into heaven. J.J. and Melanie found themselves doing the unthinkable, selecting a casket, planning a funeral, and envisioning life without their only son. In the coming days, they fell into a mind-numbing rhythm. Each morning upon wakening, they held each other and sobbed uncontrollably. After gathering enough courage to climb out of bed, they would go downstairs to the family and friends who awaited them. They would soldier through the day until bedtime. Then they would go to bed and hold each other and cry themselves to sleep. J.J. would willingly admit, there is no class or book on this planet that can prepare you to have your five-year-old son die in your arms. We know what the bottom looks like. Some of you um, here this morning, you may have never lost a child, and I pray um, that you don't. (laughs) Um, But you know what the bottom looks like. You know what it's like when things kind of fall apart. Um, I I thought about our lives in most most ways. We kind of live life kind of here. You know what I mean? Kind of like that mid-altitude, mid-level. We just kind of go through life kind kind of sitting in this point. And occasionally, every once in a while, we have these things that kind of, we spike, right? You have, you know, you have these great moments of celebration or whatever it may be, a, a wedding or a graduation or promotion, child is born, whatever it may be, you kind of peak. But then you kind of settle back into kind of mid-level cruising. And then, every once in a while, the bottom just kind of drops out. The doom buggy flips or the, or the housing market crashes or the business goes belly up or the test results come back positive or whatever it may be. And all of a sudden, now you're facing what it looks like to look at life from the bottom. Joseph, which we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, he discovered what the auction block of Egypt looked like. Chapter 39 of Genesis, verse 1 It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. Um, Joseph, this was, if you remember the story of Joseph, this is the second time he gets sold. He was sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites. A couple months later, um, and and a couple months because of just the the, the travel time that it took to get from where they were to where Egypt was, a couple months later, this 17-year-old kid is being sold again. He's put, put up on the auction block in Egypt and being sold. And think about, you know, put, try to put yourself in that, in that mindset that your, your family's betrayed you. You're sold to these people. They drag you to Egypt. They sell you again. And now you're in a place where you don't know the language. You don't know the culture. Everything's kind of stacked against you. You're being sold as a slave. And slave labor was difficult labor. It was grueling labor. This was hard. So everything was stacked against Joseph. He had no one e- in Egypt. There was no family there. There was, there was no like, common language to rely on, to even communicate well. He's, he's kind of on his own. And so in this place where, where everything's kind of falling apart and everything's been kind of stripped away from Joseph, even his, his prized coat you know, that his father had made him had, had been ripped away from him. Everything was gone. And so what's interesting to me is to read this story, and if you didn't know, you know like if you didn't grow up in Sunday school and know the story, how would you write Joseph's story 
from this point forward. I'll be honest with you, a lot of stories, we've seen a lot of stories, and you know how they typically go? The bottom dropped out, and then they ran from God. And they turned from God, and they turned to drugs, or they turned to alcohol, or they turned to sex, or they turned to whatever. That's, a way, that's the way the story goes a lot of times, that all of a sudden they harden against God, and, and, and how could God ever let this happen to them? A good God wouldn't let these things happen, and we struggle with that kind of stuff. And we would think oftentimes, if we were writing Joseph's story, we wouldn't be surprised if we turned the page, and all of a sudden everything goes back, that goes bad, that all of a sudden we're not surprised if we read Joseph plunging into anger and then despair. What's interesting, though, is if you do know Joseph's story, it's not the way the story goes. Very next verse, it says the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, a lot of times we, we don't pause to kind of understand that Joseph didn't start in the house. That's not where slaves start. Slaves don't start there. Slaves start out in the field. Slaves start with the hard labor, with the grueling labor. And for some reason, God blessed him and showed favor and put Joseph in the house now. Now he's in the house of the man that was basically running security for Pharaoh. What happened? Why, why is Joseph's story seemingly so, I mean, it draws us in, but it seems like it's so different than all the other stories that we often hear about. Because the stories I'm aware of, the story I've probably even lived, is bad things happen, how can God let bad things happen? I'll run from God, I'll blame God, I'll harbor just anger against God, and I'll start filling my life with all this other stuff as I run as far as I can from God. Why does Joseph's story not go that way? We can, it's just a few of us, you guys can, more lesson rather than, like, more dialogue than monologue. Why doesn't Joseph's story go that way? Huh? He couldn't run? Yeah, actually, I think it's, it's in that first phrase. The Lord was with Joseph. And, and beyond that, he knew it. He knew it. See, that's, I think that's what separates Joseph from, from a lot of us. As while, while we may kind of intellectually believe God hasn't abandoned us, we don't live as if he hasn't. We make decisions as if God doesn't care, as if he has abandoned us, as, as, if, as if he just turned his back and all of this stuff just happened. I want you to watch something real quick in these few verses in Genesis 32, or 39, I'm sorry. First it says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. Verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him. Verse 5, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Later in verse 5, the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had. Here's where Joseph's story like, takes a hard left turn from all the other self-help and, and, and like here's the secret to success formulas that are out there in the world right now. Right now in, in the world, there's all these things that say, he, the way you overcome these difficulties is you look within. You look for this inner power. You look for, for something within you. And in, in essence, the message is this. Dig deeper. Dig deeper. It's in you. You can do better. You can, you can be better. You can overcome this. That it's all kind of within you. Joseph's story encourage us to do something else. It says to look higher. Because it's not, a, it's not about how determined you are. It's about whose you are. Brother Scott was walking us through some, some lessons that he's prepping for the next, in the next few weeks in the book of Ephesians, it sounds like. Joseph understood what it meant to be in Christ. He understood what it meant to have that relationship with Christ. God, and if you were here this morning, you understand that in and with and, and next to and attached to are all the same words. He understood that. He understood it wasn't about his abilities, but it was about the person, the God that he belonged to. Joseph succeeded because God was present, and he knew it. You ever been in your own version of Egypt? Ever been there? You just, whatever it is, it, you, it, it's brought you down Maybe it's uh, you know, money or issues or financial issues or, or maybe you had some expectations. You thought here's what was going to happen and it didn't happen that way. Um, maybe your friends have kind of walked away. They're, they're not there at the moment that you need them. You feel kind of far from home and you feel all alone. And oftentimes we wonder, you know, who's left? Who's left in my corner? If you're here this morning, you're a child of God. God is. God's still there. God's still in your corner. 
Let me share with you David, what he asked. He asked this. He said, where can I go to get away from your spirit, and where can I run from you? And then he listed various places he found God. He said, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. And if I lie down in the grave, you are there. If I rise with the sun in the east and settle in the west beyond the sea, even there you would guide me. With your right hand, you would hold me. Joseph's version probably would have read something like this. Where can I go to get away from your spirit? If I go down to the bottom of a dry pit, or I go up on top of the auction block, or I go into the home of some foreigner, even there, you would guide me. Your right hand would still hold me. I don't know what your version of this verse would be. You know, maybe you, you fill in the blanks with whatever it is. Even to the oncology specialist's office, you're there. Even in the midst of that horrible, horrible wreck, God, you're still there. Even in the shelter for battered women or the county jail or the overseas deployment office, whatever it may be, God, you still would guide me. Your right hand, you would still hold me. Let this, let this thought sink in for just a moment, if you would. You will never go where God is not. Never. And I know a lot of times we venture into things and we think we're all alone. And we think, I have, to, I have to overcome this challenge. I'm on my own here. If you're a child of God, that's not true. And, and, and Ryan pointed it out this morning. I really appreciate what he said. It, it, there's a big challenge for us as Christians. To understand the reality is one thing. To live within that reality and embrace it and grab it is a totally different thing. Joseph, 17 years old, and I think he kind of got it. He understood that I'm God's and he's mine. I love the powerful truth that's shared by Paul, Acts, the 17th chapter, verse 27. It says, God wanted them to seek him in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I, I, I really love that last line. He is not far from each one of us. Isn't it cool that God doesn't play favorites? That everyone in the world is invited and, and welcomed into his presence. Problem is, there's a lot of people who won't enter in. Children of God included. Christians included. Not in a sense that you're not saved, but that we don't live kind of in that, that understanding and that presence that God is with us. He is for us. He is here for us. And we kind of live as if we've been kind of abandoned by our Father. Many of us just plod through life as if there was no God to love us. Many people believe that the only strength they have is their own strength. Many people believe that the only solution they really have is the one they come up with. And in a sense, here's the sad thing. There's Christians today, and, and, and I hope this isn't us fitting into this category, but at times it is me. There's Christians living today that live godless lives. Not in the sense that we don't believe he exists, we just don't believe he cares as much as he says he does. We just don't believe he really, he's really involved in our day-to-day -day lives. We believe somehow he's detached and far away, and we're kind of on our own, and hopefully somehow we'll kind of make it. That's not at all the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is, I've come to you. I'm here with you. Emmanuel, I'm not going anywhere. Every once in a while, there are Josephs among us, people who who sense and are sensitive to the presence of God. People who pursue God like Moses did. Remember his story? Uh, sometimes I, I think, you know, we read through the Exodus, and you grow up in church and you know the stories and you know, you know Red Sea and all this really cool stuff. But sometimes we forget the task that, Joseph, or that Moses was, was given. Here's a guy who's given a task of leaving, leading like two million ex-slaves out of slavery in the middle of the desert. And, 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 and you, have to, you have to think about that. So he was probably wondering how, they were gonna, how he was going to provide for these people. Moses, I want you to leave my people out. Okay. How do we provide? How do we defend ourselves against not only the elements, but the enemies that are out there? What do we do? Moses knew he needed some things, right? Just think about this. If you were, if you were given the task today, if I came to you and said, hey, I need you to lead out an expedition, and I'm not going to give you two million people to lead. I want you to leave you know, the, I don't know, 50, 60, however many people here, I want you to lead them on an expedition uh, for the next several months. 
what would you begin thinking about? Kind of supplies, right? What do we need to do this? What kind of a, what do we need to gather up to make this trip? We need, we need supplies and we need managers and we need people, you know, assigned tasks and we need all these things. But I want you to listen to what Moses prayed for when he prayed for help. I want you to look at his prayer. He says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. In essence, Moses preferred to go nowhere with God than to go anywhere without him. Moses said, you know what? If your presence doesn't go with us, I don't want to go. And, and, and it wasn't that he didn't care about all these other issues that he still had to answer. He knew what was most important. What was most important was God's presence in the middle of all this. David understood this as well. David, in an, in an Egypt of his own making, had seduced the wife of a soldier. And he covers up this sin with, with more murder and lies and more sin. And David, if you read the story, you put kind of the, 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 the storyline together, he basically runs and hides from God for like a year. He just avoids God. And then he realizes at some point he can't run forever. He can't hide forever. And when he finally confesses his sin to God, here's the request he made. Cast me not away from your presence. and Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David understood what was most important. And what was most important, think about this prayer. I, I love what God's word says, but I also always love what he doesn't say. David doesn't pray, do not take my kingdom from me. David's king, powerful king. He doesn't pray, do not take my wealth from me. Do not take my, you know, my, my power and, and, and all my influence. He doesn't pray that. He says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't cast me away from your presence. David knew what mattered most, and that's what he pursued. He, he passionately pursued the presence of God. What does that mean? I'll just throw it out to you guys. What does it mean to passionately pursue God's presence, and how do you do it? How do you passionately pursue God's presence? What does that even mean? Have you heard that? I mean, David prays this, right? David says, do not cast me away from your presence. And Moses prays, hey, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to go anywhere. So what does that mean? As as believers, as as children of God, what does it mean to pursue God's presence? Isn't he there, right, already? So what does that mean for us to pursue that? It gets you guys to participate. Like I said, it's just just us. You guys talk back. What, is that, what does that mean if you're going to pursue God's presence? Or how do you do it? Yeah. You ever, you ever been in a room with somebody and, and like their presence was there, I guess, and you could kind of feel it? You knew that, like, have you ever had that, like, I don't know if you have pets. You ever have, like, a pet that, like, like gets, like, right in your face and you're, like, asleep? And you know they're there. And, and so there's a couple things you do. Um, you either acknowledge their presence and then like headbutt the, ch- the, 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 the pet. No, I'm just kidding. You, or you try to ignore their presence, right? You're given a couple of choices. You can, there's a couple things you can do. I can either acknowledge their presence and, and be fully aware of it, or I can try to ignore their presence. And, and, and the thing is, is it doesn't diminish the fact that they're there. What changes is how I perceive them. How do I pursue them? How do I address them if they are there? And God tells us over and over again, he's there. And what do we do with that? I was going to bring a, like an object lesson or something this morning. And I heard this illustration. I thought it was a good illustration. It said, become more of a sponge and less of a rock. I thought that was kind of interesting. And get like a bowl of water. And if I put a rock in a bowl of water and I take it out, what's changed about the rock? It's wet, and within a few minutes, it dries, and it looks the same. The outside gets wet. It may change color. I used to love doing that when I was a little kid. You know, you find rocks, and you put them in water, and you watch them change color or whatever it may be, and they like, get really pretty or whatever if you put them in the water. Um, that, the outside changes, but nothing happens to the inside of the rock. But what about a sponge? When I put a sponge in there, what happens? That, ch- that, that sponge changes The essence of the sponge changes because it allows the water to just infuse in every pore. It's there. That's what it means to be aware and to pursue the presence of God. To know that he's there, but to let that just seep into you. And what's really cool about a sponge 
is if God is, is, is just infusing in every pore, when you're wrung out in those difficult times, in those difficult places, God's spilling into the lives of other people as they watch you go through your wringing out. That's kind of how God, that's why God allows us oftentimes to go do, through difficult things. It's not because he enjoys us walking through difficult, watching us walk through difficult things. It's because he knows that the ultimate outcome is not only the growth of our faith, but the, but the opportunity for God to touch other lives through your difficulty. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. You know that the, the testing of your faith produces patience. And let God just have that, that perfect work in our lives. Why? It's not just about us and our faith being stretched. It's about other people's lives that are impacted because of that. The interesting thing is, in that illustration, we get to choose whether we're the rock or we're the sponge. You get to choose whether you're going to resist God and what he wants to do in your life and through your life, even in the middle of difficulties, or are you going to absorb what he wants to do and who he is and how he wants to live and, and, and stretch our faith through those, those difficult times and those hard times. Let me encourage you with, with a few things here as we, as we kind of wrap up this morning, just with the idea of seeking to open our hearts and our lives to God's presence. Here's the first thing. We often need to lay claim to the nearness of God. I think a lot of times we live as if God is far away and he's... We have this weird mindset that he's up in, the, up in the heavens looking down and he's really not involved. He really doesn't care. We're kind of on our own. But I love, I love how the Amplified Bible renders the last part of Hebrews 13.5. It says this, God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you or give you up nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless nor forsake you nor let you down or ever Relax my hold on you. Most surely not. I love that. Is God not clear about his presence? He says, I'm not going anywhere. Ever. No matter what it is you're walking through right now, I'm not going anywhere. I haven't left you helpless. I won't forsake you. I won't let you down or ever relax my hold on you. I love I love the words in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. It says this. It says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever, have you ever lost kind of the sense of God's presence, though? Ever felt like he wasn't there? Have you ever felt that way? I think we all have. And that's where it gets dangerous. And I know a lot of times we're thinking, well, well, you just need to understand the truth. Let me share with you. Even Job kind of lost the sense of God's presence. Look what he says. In Job, the 23rd chapter, verses 8 and 9, he says, but if I go to the east, he is not there. Really, Job? Because he's everywhere. But that's what Job felt. He says, if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. And when he is at work in the north, I do not see him. And when he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. Job felt far from God. In spite of his inability to feel God, here's the very next verse, though, that Job, Job determines this. He says, but he knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So in a sense, what Job says is, I'm in this place where sometimes I just feel like I'm so far from God. But even though I may feel that way, he knows me. He knows every step I'm taking, every turn in the road. He knows this. Sometimes our faith needs to be like Job's. It needs to be determined faith. Sometimes we like feel-good faith. You know, we like the, I'm on the mountaintop and God's doing everything, all these great things. And I have so much faith in God because he's just doing these great and more amazing things. And I, I feel close because God's doing it the way I would do it if it were me to do it. You know, like, like, as long as we agree with God, he's good. But we need to have kind of that determined faith at time, from time to time. Those difficult days that demand determined decisions of faith. I love the determined words of the psalmist in Psalm 56.3. He says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. It's like a determination. It, it, it's, it's, it's like that gritty determination that sometimes I think as Christians... Uh, we either haven't been told that we need it 
or we've been told that somehow if you have to really push yourself, it's kind of not worth it. I'll share with you. There's times during your faith walk where it takes just that kind of gritty determination to say, you know what, no matter how I feel, I'm going to believe what God said. And I'm going to, put my, I'm going to hang my trust and, and place my faith in that. Psalmist writes this in Psalm 42.5, Why, my soul, are you downcast and why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. And then he says, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I love, I love that. It's almost like self-talk, you know. It's like the psalmist is he's like, I'm talking. He's like talking to himself. And I, I think as Christians, sometimes, sometimes we need a good talking to. You know, sometimes we need to talk to ourselves and say, hey, you know what? I know I'm down and I know I'm discouraged right now, but I'm going to praise him. I will yet praise him. I'm going to trust him, even though I may not feel like he's very close. Here's, here's the thing. We need to be careful not to equate the presence with God with how we feel. And a lot of times that happens. It happens, I, it happens to me. It happens to a lot of us. We equate the presence of God with how we feel. The reality is God is near us whether we're happy or not. He's there. Whether the circumstances feel good or not, he's there. Our feelings do not negate God's faithfulness. And sometimes it's, it's a dangerous thing. I know, I think, Lisa, you guys had walked through some things a while back about feelings and emotions and these kinds of things. Those are great things. We've been given those things. But it's, it's a bad thing when those start to dictate how we think and how we believe and what we do, when we allow our feelings to kind of dictate that. God is near whether we're, we're happy or not, whether our circumstances feel good or not. Here's another crucial step in, in trying to open our lives and open our hearts to God's presence. We've got to cling to God's character. Spend some time in your Bible. Read through and pull out some of the things that God just says about himself. And he says about you as a, as a child of God. Just grab onto those things and latch onto them and don't forget them. Let them be pressed into your heart. The psalmist wrote, he says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And I love that the, the psalmist says, you know what, I took his word and I just pressed it in. Because there's days where that's what's going to hold you up. There's days where those words and those truths from God's word are the only thing kind of going your way that day. You've got to hold on to those. And you've got to know them in, or, in order to lean on them heavily. Here's some things that are, that, are, that are true. And just let them just sink in a little bit. God is love. God is love. And, and, and here's, how the, here's how the conversation often goes, at least conversation I've been in from time to time with folks that are struggling. If God loves me, then why? And, and then fill in the blank. The problem with that whole question is it starts with the premise that God may not love them. There's nothing further from the truth. Nothing further from the truth. As soon as it says, if God loves, it's like, oh, hold on, hang on, back up. What do you mean, if? He is. He can't not love you because that's who he is. God is love. God is still sovereign. Even though it seems like your world may be spinning out of control, God's still sovereign. He still knows your name personally, intimately. We just sang the song, you're still in his hands. He didn't drop you off at the curb and walk away. You're still in his hands. Angels still respond to his call. The hearts of rulers still still yield to his bidding. The death of Jesus on the cross still saves souls. The spirit of God still indwells saints. Heaven is still only a heartbeat away. The grave is still not the end. God is still faithful. He is never caught off guard. He uses everything for his glory and your ultimate good. He uses tragedy to accomplish his will, and his will is always right and holy and perfect. Sorrow may come with the night, but joy still comes in the morning. God still bears fruit in his children in the midst of affliction. When J.J. Jasper told his oldest daughter about Cooper's death, he prepared her by saying, I need you to hold on to everything you know of who God is because I have some really tough news to tell you. 
that is the wisest counsel I've probably heard in a long time. I need you to hold on to everything you know about who God is. Because see, the father of lies wants to plant seeds of deception in the minds of God's people. He he can't take your soul, but if he can ruin your mindset, you've become ineffective in God's kingdom work. You're no longer an ambassador for the king. You're kind of a a disparaged and discouraged and defeated child sitting on the side of the road thinking your father doesn't care, doesn't know, and doesn't love you. You need to know, you need to hold on to everything you know about who God is, especially in those moments of difficulty and struggle and hardship and heartbreak. You need to hold on to that. In changing times, We have to cling to the unchanging character of God. I love this verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know what I love most about this verse? It's punctuated with a period. Period. In in, in essence, end of discussion. No more questions about if God. No, God does love you. Not if God loved me. He does love you. Well, if if God really love me, then, then, then he would work this out this way. God loves you and his will is perfect and holy. His timing is always right. And whatever it is you're walking through, it's for his glory and your good. And it was really cool last week. I don't know if you're here. Was it FBI? Um, we were listening and it was cool. The, the speaker in that said, God's glory and your good are inseparable. Did you know that? That God's glory and your good are inseparable. That whatever God does for his glory is for your good. And sometimes we think about, well, he's just going to punish me for his glory. Really? What kind of a crazy dad does that? I'm going to beat up my kids so I look good. What? It's not what he does. It's not what he does. I love the words to the old hymn, my hope is built on nothing less. The final line of the third verse says this. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. This was written by a gentleman, Edward Mote, back in 1834. I love researching the history of some of the old hymns, like where they came from. This song was written for a friend of his whose wife was lying, dying. He wrote those words. I think God gave him those words to write. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Another critical step in in opening our hearts and lives to God's presence is this one. Pray your pain out. Just pray the pain out. A lot of times, I don't know about you, but you go through difficult things and, and, and some people are, you know, very, they're able to kind of express it, I guess, in some ways, and others don't, you know. A lot of times, people... I tend to kind of bottle that up, you know, the, the, this painful thing, and they just bottle it all up. Or, or you kind of have that other extreme where they kind of just unload it, like on anyone and everyone. It's kind of those kind of things. Let me share with you. God's shoulders are big enough for us to cry our pain out on. And, and that's what he truly desires. He desires real prayers and real honesty from us in those moments. And I think sometimes we're almost afraid to be honest with God in our pain, you know, It's like, okay, no, it doesn't really hurt. He wants us to pray that that pain out. He doesn't look for strong faces. He desires sincere hearts. Look what this verse says. In Psalm 51, 6, it says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. It says, God wants wants some real honesty. He wants some honesty in that prayer. Not not this brave face, not this strong face. He wants a sincere heart. Then listen to what the psalmist writes in Psalm 142. He says, I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. And a lot of times, like, we've been taught, like, the, I don't know, like, the, the, the right, like, courtesy things to do. Like, when you pray, just don't pray to God in anger. You know, you've got to get that all worked out and then go to him and tell him how you're not really angry and you're okay with everything. Actually, the psalmist says, I pour out my plate before him. I tell my trouble before him. Did you know that God won't turn away from you if you pray in pain? And in anger, he won't turn away from you in that. Matter of fact, Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 7, tells us that even Jesus offered up prayers with loud cries and tears. 
Think Garden of, e- or Garden of Gethsemane for a second. Think about the prayers that Jesus offered up there. Those weren't prayers of, okay, I'm okay with this. Got a cross, we'll do it, not a big deal. It says that he, that he fell to the ground in such agony that he prayed so hard that he, he, he sweat and he, and, he, and he capillaries, his face broke forth and it was like blood mixed with water dripping off of his body. That's how extreme and how excruciating his prayer was. And his prayer wasn't, I'm okay with this. It was, Father, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. He offered up prayers with loud cries and tears, and I don't know, when was the last time you cried out to God? In your pain, in your questions. I think if there's anything that we can learn from the life of Job, we have to learn that it's better to shake a fist at God than to turn your back on Him. Because that's what Job kind of does for a big chunk of the book. He questions God as to why. And ultimately, through that conversation and through him coming to God and not turning his back on God, but just kind of opening himself up saying, God, why would you allow this to happen to my life? God continued to just mold him and shape him and, and help him understand that maybe, maybe all the detailed information, maybe all the, the minute details aren't going to be answered for you, Job, the way you want it to be answered, but they're going to be answered in accordance to my will for my glory, and ultimately you're good. The words of Augustine ring true here. He said this, how deep in the deep are they who do not cry out of the deep? How deep in the deep are they who do not cry out of the deep? You weren't built to just suffer pain and difficulty and struggle on your own. That's not how God wired you. He wired you to come to Him with that. Our words may fail and our thoughts may not be well put together, but don't quit praying. Don't quit crying out from the deep. Don't quit going to God, seeking His grace and strength and wisdom. Don't hide from God. Here's last element, and, and then we'll get ready to close. If we're going to open ourselves up to God's presence and really pursue Him, passionately pursue Him, here's a step that's needful in that. We need to lean on God's people. We need to lean on God's people. So many times we hit bumps or we hit rock bottom and we tend to push away from from our church family. But if God's presence brings healing, that that healing that we so desperately need, then Jesus' words in Matthew 18.20 are more than a suggestion. They're actually a prescription from the great physician. Because he says this, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. In the midst of them. So if we understand God's presence brings healing, then wouldn't we want to be where God's presence is at? Wouldn't that make sense? And I get it. I know a lot of times we go through things and we think, you know, we just kind of back away and we push away and we're like, ah, it's just too much to take on. But Jesus says, you know what? In those moments, the best thing you can do is to gather where other people are gathered in my name because I'm there. My presence is there. Think about this for just a second. Would it make sense for somebody struggling with disease to avoid the hospital? Does that make sense? Does it make sense for somebody that's incredibly hungry to avoid the food pantry? It doesn't make sense for those of us that are children of God to abandon those folks, that kind of that hope distribution center where God wants us to sense and to seek his presence doesn't make sense to do that. There's a story, if you're familiar with it, in the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus, and it talks about a battle that Moses and the Israelites would fight against the Amalekites. And if you remember the story, um, it, it's, this, it's a strange story because the strategy was kind of weird. Moses tells Joshua to go down into the valley and to fight the battle, but Moses instead climbs up on top of the hill above this battle but he, what's interesting about the story is he doesn't climb up there above, alone. He doesn't climb this hill and sit up there by himself. He actually takes two people with him. He takes Aaron and he takes her with him. And so while Joshua leads the battle in the valley and he's leading the physical combat, Moses is engaging in a spiritual fight. And Aaron and her are standing on either 